And good morning to you, Daniel. Good morning, Glenn. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on Design and Dialogue. Um, do let us know out there, listeners, watchers, where you're zooming in from. Uh, feel free to say hi in the chat box. Also, if you have questions for Daniel that arise, please put those in the chat box too. We'll get to them at the end. And Daniel, you're uh, currently in the Woodstock area in upstate New York. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Good. Nice and calm there, I hope. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. So what's the uh, last month been like for you as you've been contending with the continued turbulence that's swirling around us in this country? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're finally back into the studio, obviously working with masks and, and socially distanced. Um, the space is quite big in there, so we're actually able to be physically apart. Um, but, you know, took a, a couple of days break upstate before I really get back into it because we were off so long. Uh, I have a couple projects coming up later this fall, which are still in limbo, but um, we're going to continue working towards them. Uh, and I've, you know, continued painting a lot. Um, you know, it was a sort of early, uh, really what I studied in school was painting. And I hadn't really uh, been doing it very frequently. In fact, the last time that I um, had paintings in an exhibition, we were looking back, it was 2012. So, I'm thinking about um, including some uh, of these new paintings that I've been making over quarantine in an exhibition uh, early next year uh, in New York. Hmm. That's super interesting because I, I feel like a lot of people have been, of course, forced away from the normal complexity of their day-to-day -day output. And, you know, sometimes you hear about it in a kind of vernacular sense, like sourdough bread or whatever, gardening, whatever people are doing. And I suppose painting might be one way of kind of retaining focus and trying to channel some of the energy in a more local sense. I mean, you know what it was for me is that a lot of the things I'm known for now are more sculptural, larger uh, objects, um, things that require space and techniques that I just didn't have uh, when I was younger. And so painting has always been this thing to go back to that is very inexpensive, it's very simple, you can do it almost anywhere. Um, and it, it, in some ways, it's kind of going back to the roots of, of what brought me to art uh, in general. Mm. Um, and in, in fact, it's really, in most of the sculptural work that I create, uh, I have assistants in the studio, right? So there, uh, there are techniques um, that require multiple people working on things at a particular time. There are certain works which can't even physically be lifted by one person. Um, but painting is the one thing that I continue to go back to that's a kind of solitary, uh, solitary, you know, work in a mm. way. And do you find it restorative in a way, emotionally, artistically? I mean, it's, I, I the, the material quality of it, of working um, with paint, I think is, is very different from sculpture because you really feel and see every aspect of it. Um, you know, the other thing uh, about getting back into to painting is I'm colorblind. So I, I spent, um, early in my career, most of the works that I made were, were gouache uh, on Mylar paintings. Mm -hmm. And I liked the gouache. I had learned about it actually when I studied architecture in school. It was like kind of a rudimentary way of creating uh, renderings. And one of the beautiful things about the gouache is just this very ultra matte uh, surface that uh, it can create. And I was never really able to find that with acrylic or any other medium on canvas and so I worked for about a year um, with golden paints uh, basically they mixed me a custom uh, paint that's uh, created in these gradients um, of color so even though I don't entirely see the color they've mixed me a range of gradient um, and then bottles are all numbered so I can just <laughs> look at them as I'm going through the images but they really managed to achieve this incredible, uh, super highly pigmented uh, paint that is, has a fully ultra matte, almost like velvet uh, quality when it sits on the canvas. So just being able to, um, to get into that has been amazing these past few months. I understand you actually got a pair of glasses pretty recently that allowed you to see colors, if not in a way that a, a fully, um, well, a totally non-colorblind person would, certainly differently from how you had. So the, the type of colorblindness that I have is very restrictive in, in two particular areas of the, of the light spectrum. It doesn't mean that I don't see color at all, 
Um, it means that in those ranges of the light spectrum, there is a vast reduction in variation. So you might see hundreds or even millions of variations of color, um, and my palette is reduced. So what these glasses um, that I got do is they artificially refract the light in those particular spectrums, which give you a, um, you know, I, I talked a lot to my ophthalmologist about this and she thinks the whole thing is like BS. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's really fooling my eye into seeing variation, but her position is that it doesn't actually, uh, that I'm not actually still seeing it the way that, that you might, mm. but it was fun nonetheless. And I wore them for a number of months and then sort of got, um, got tired of seeing this, uh, call it two color for world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it might be something we bear in mind as we look through the images now, uh, just because, of course, you are very well known for this very strong monochrome aesthetic that's sometimes punctuated with very strong color. So it's just interesting to know that about you when looking at the work. Mm. But also, I don't know what you would think of this, but I'm quite struck by the metaphorical implications of that story you just told, because it raises these questions of mediation. Obviously, we're talking right now through a screen. So that is another kind of filter that we're always processing art through these days. Objectivity, for sure, because it's like, when, once I started really delving into this idea of color perception, um, it's not, it's not uh, scientifically proven that we all see the same color. It's just that we agree that certain things are the same, right? Um, so there's a very interesting idea around what is the truth in, in uh, visual quality of something? Yeah, so it's, it's like the, a fundamental example of the relativism of perception, which of course is one of the great themes of your work, so mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's, um, let's go ahead and look at some images because we have a lot to look at. Um, I guess, Daniel, it would be fair to say that you first became truly well known for this series called Fictional Archaeology, um, which includes these I would call them commodities uh, of particular resonance to you that seem to have become dislodged in time and could perhaps be read as the discoveries of a future archaeologist. Um, I, the, our conversation is really focused on the design, and I know there's a million ways of thinking about this body of work, but I guess I wanted to ask you to comment on it in relation to the commodity form and to the design object and why that became such a central motif for you. Yeah, I mean, this whole uh, series came out of an experience uh, in, an, in Easter Island, which is a South Pacific island, where there is still dispute among archaeologists about the origin of the famous Moai statues, these massive heads that are on the island. Um, and after I returned from there, I just started thinking about the way that we think about history and archaeology, which is very definitive, right? We, we look at Egyptian or um, Greek or Roman, and we, we accept the kind of narrative there. Um, but inherently, it's impossible to know exactly what happened. So I started to think about the, the kind of malleability of archaeology. And certainly, archaeology, as we imagine it, is only of the past. But what if I could imagine a kind of archaeology of the future and sort of project these contemporary objects um, into a distant future? You know, obviously, everything that we see around us, all the objects that we touch, the buildings that we live in and house, um, one day will all become these kind of archeological uh, relics. Um, so how, how should I do that? And I really wanted these objects to have a, a material quality that would speak to their, their meaning in a way. So rather than taking this radio, for instance, and kind of painting it to look old like a trompe l'oeil, um, it was remade in a uh, geological material. So in this case, volcanic ash, crystal, things that we, uh, we have an almost um, you know, mythical uh, association with these materials, uh, and we, we think about them in geological time frames. So by transforming this object, there is a kind of, um, you know, there's a truth about it, a truth quality that's built into the object. And the material of the thing, uh, in many ways, can tell us as much about the story, the object, as the visual quality of the kind of decay uh, and erosion. It strikes me that it's also a kind of truth that uh, has to do with distance or distancing, 
it makes me think of the the classical idea of the Archimedean point, like you pull way, 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 way back, and then you can um, see it. something truly, um, like you're standing back even from a planet. Um, but I, I also wanted to ask you about the personal valence of this work. Um, so you grew up in Miami, um, and you know, in a certain period of time when, of course, there was a pop culture, like every kid. And one thing that strikes me about the work is that it seems quite rooted in early experience and for the, the whole idea of commodities as part of our formative experiences. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether, in addition to that idea of a kind of transhistorical or temporally expansive archaeological point of view, there isn't also an element of autobiography in these objects. I mean, certainly any object that I select has a particular resonance with me, but I also picked the objects because I felt that they were sort of iconic in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, in the most basic way, if you open up your emoji keyboard, almost all the objects that are present on there could be things that I could, could cast. A radio, a basketball, you know, mm -hmm. a microphone, these things that we all agree, uh, they have a particular meaning and resonance and they're global. Right, this work could be shown in New York or Taipei or you know Japan. It, it's all going to have the same sort of um, key moment, and particularly it's linked with a time period. So we know when this uh, would have existed, right? Twentieth, twenty-first century, something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about the materiality of it, though? Because there's a, a very, very strong contrast between that global, perhaps American defined, but as you say, global pop material culture that you're mining and the materials they're using, for example, this is blue calcite, which is not something people will normally encounter. It has a quite exotic and sort of foreign quality to it. And I wonder about that vibration in the work too. So the, the selection of materials early on was largely based on, you know, the volcanic ash was black, the quartz was white. Um, and once I got these glasses, going back to the colorblind thing, I sort of felt after using them for a couple of months that I could actually introduce color into the work because I felt that I had, if not a completely objective view of it, a somewhat more you know, objective view. And so I started to look at colored crystal, amethyst, um, you know, pink quartz, in this case, blue calcite. Um, and what's happening here in terms of the tonality uh, is the amount of blue calcite that's introduced versus the quartz is creating a, a, a basically a gradient of color um, mm. across these. Um, and then, you know, when I, when I first made this piece, I actually made a, like a shelf along the wall um, that held the balls, almost like how you would find in like a like a museological display, right? Like an ar archeological museum. Um, and then I, I was at a Nets game, right? And for the game, they're warming up and there was the rack of balls. And I was like, why don't I just use that? So I remade one of those um, and used the actual device that you would have you know, initially found these on as the display mechanism for it. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of uh, strange realism, despite the kind of surrealist displacement or, or um, strangeness that you're imparting to the object through this casting process? I mean, all of these have an element of the uncanny within them, right? They feel like something we know, but they're slightly different. There's a bit of uh, uneasiness in the idea of decay around them. Mm -hmm. um, but I always like to think of them as having this kind of in-between uh, sense where, although they appear that they're falling apart, they're made of something like crystal that we associate with growth. So there is this potential within them to be kind of oscillating on a time scale. They're falling apart or they're growing together. Yeah. So they're Janus faced in a way, which is, I suppose, the nature of time, which is what you're exploring. Yeah. Um, hey, speaking of the uncanny, <laughs> let's look at uh, this um, architectural project. Um, and I'm just going to if you don't mind, read a very brief thing that Virgil Abloh, your fellow designer artist, uh, interdisciplinary um, figure wrote about your work. He described your architectural projects as um, occurring against the background of a white noise of domestic space that you were in some way bringing to the surface. And he 
I, I really thought of this um, when looking at this particular image. He spoke about your summoning of anonymous actors hiding and moving and reaching within the walls, uh, which he interpreted as a close read of our position in the world unstable, which I thought was a beautiful way of kind of nailing down what's happening in these works. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I want to ask you maybe two questions about this. One is about the animation of architecture, which is something that you explored um, with your partner, Alex Mastone, and it's an architecture, of course, mm. and continued to explore since. And this idea of a kind of um, almost like a spirit or liveness of architecture. Uh, it's often said that you do architecture, have architecture doing things that it's not meant to do. And I think that animation is a big part of that. Mm. But I also wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about interdisciplinarity itself because like Ablo, you work across all of these different disciplines. And I wonder what your motivations in doing that and what you find specifically in architecture. Mm. So this, uh, this image was part of a very large exhibition that I did in Moscow a number of years ago, which included a number of works which, which uh, manipulated the architectural surface. And typically when architecture is in a state of fluidity, uh, bad things are happening, right? Like an earthquake or a tornado or something. Um, and when architecture can be put in a position of, and architects do this often, um, sometimes to create uh, a destabilization, um, to create an, an idea of permanence or solidity. And they play with our notions of that. Um, in much of these works, the, the gesture that I'm doing uh, within the architecture is often quite subtle. Obviously this image is framed, but um, there was a lot of uh, spaces within this exhibition that had nothing in them. So you might walk into a room and not immediately notice um, this wall kind of melting or a wall eroding. And um, I mean, a lot's been written in, in relation to this experience that I had as a child of this uh, hurricane in, in Miami that completely destroyed my uh, childhood home, which, you know, I didn't, looking back on it, I didn't find to be particularly traumatic. It certainly influenced me. Um, it was more a fascination with something that we imagine um, to be uh, something that is meant to give comfort, uh, having this non-permanent quality. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the works that I've made manipulate the architectural surface in ways that are more subtle. Um, they play with our idea of the solidity of it. Um, and you know, you could flip through these, but I went through all these different um, ways of manipulating it. So sometimes it could be melting, it could be eroding, it could look like a sheet blowing in the wind. In this case, it looks like it's stretching. Um, and there's, a, even though these are sort of, um, you know, they can be frightening in a way, they're all, there's also a little bit of a, of a comedic kind of lightness to them, you know? There's a playfulness to them. So they tread this line between, you know, and that's sort of where, um, you know, the best, I guess, horror cinema, right, operates is in between this line of something that you know and that you don't know. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think also that there's a specifically digital quality to these projects, not that they're rendered digitally necessarily, because uh, there's obviously a lot of very bespoke handwork in realizing them, like your sculptures. Mm. If I were to suggest to you that they're the kinds of images that only somebody who had been saturated in the digital environment would invent, would you agree with that? I've never thought of that. Um, I always, you know, all of the works, even within SN architecture, a lot of the works that we make are very analog. You know, this, this piece is entirely hand sculpted. Um, so there's a, I don't know, I hadn't thought about the digital nature of it. Certainly I grew up in the age of video games and Nintendo and all of that. Um, I think that's had more of an influence on me in, in relation to the characters. You know, all of this, I've been working on this massive project with Pokemon for the last two years. Yeah. Um, so perhaps, you know, in that way, certainly. In, in these works, I don't know. I guess I'm also wondering whether there's, I agree with you about, or I see the comedic quality as well as the unsettling surrealistic mm -hmm. quality. I guess I also wonder whether there's at least an, an edge of critique here in the sense that um, whether digital or not, architecture and architects often assign themselves the right to transform other people's environments in this very kind of dominating top-down way. 
very non-democratic in, in some respects. And I guess this um, morphing of space that you engage in, to me, it, it sort of raises um, the possibility of, a, of an objection to that whole set of behaviors, a kind of critique of architecture as it's normally practiced. I mean, certainly, you know, I think architecture can be quite rigid. And in fact, if we think about it in a certain way, architecture is one of the only sort of artistic disciplines in which the subjects of that are unwitting participants, right? They don't know that they're being influenced <clears throat> in the same way that when you see a film or you watch, a, uh, you know, you're looking at a painting or a sculpture, you, you are intentionally engaging with an artistic medium. When you're in a building, some, every aspect of that has been designed by somebody, even if it's terrible, you're going to have, it's gonna have an impression and leave a mark on you. Um, but I don't think people think about architecture in that same artistic fashion as they do a painting uh, or a sculpture. Yeah, so in contrast, let's say to fashion, which you go and choose in the store, architecture is something that happens to you. A absolutely, and, and cities as well. You know, we all have experience where different cities feel different way. That has to do with the material quality of the buildings, the width of the streets, what the stoplights feel like, what, how the roads are divided, all of that. Hmm. Could I just get back to the question of interdisciplinarity for a second? Um, and I'll, I'll put up this image, which is from your project at BAM, which is called Rules of the Game, mm -hmm. uh, collaboration with Jonah Bo Boker and uh, Farrell Williams. And just um, ask you again about that question of movement, lateral shifting from one uh, situation to another. And in fact, you have a lot of experience, I know, in set design, including famously with Merce Cunningham uh, towards the end of his career. Yeah, you know, in school, I, I did study painting. I did a little bit of uh, work in architecture. In fact, <laughs> having those two disciplines, my thesis project was an architecture project um, that involved drawings that um, was actually, my thesis advisor was Anthony Vidler, who wrote um, this amazing book called The, the, architectural, the architectural Uncanny, mm. um, which I highly recommend. I, I don't know, I, I never really distinguished, and part of it perhaps was Cooper Union, where I went to school, didn't place a big um, insistence on students choosing discipline. So mm. you could take painting courses one semester, you could take architecture or film, and so I think the idea of medium less so as a kind of uh, dogmatic focus and more as a vehicle towards uh, a, a, a unified idea was something more open to me. So following school, you know, I worked in sculpture and um, painting and film. And in this case, um, when I was 24, I was invited to collaborate with Merce Cunningham. I worked with him for a number of years and he had a sort of interesting way of, of working in which um, you were collaborating, but none of the, the artists actually knew what the other one was doing. So he would do his stage design, I would create my set, and then we would come together um, for the premiere. So all he asked was that I didn't put anything on the stage that would injure the dancers. <laughs> that was his one caveat. Um, so that was certainly a lesson in working in a medium that is so different. You know, there's, there's so many advantages and disadvantages to working in stage. The primary advantage is that as opposed to a gallery or a museum, the audience can't move. So there's all of these tricks that you can play about their fixed perspective, um, which I employed in a, in a number of different um, scenographies that uh, we did with him. Um, this piece that we're looking at now is actually a work that I created with um, Jonah Bocaire, who was a dancer in Merce's company, and after Merce died, went off uh, on his own. This piece, uh, it was, the, the title of the work was Rules of the Game, and it was really about, um, for me, about the, our perception of time uh, within uh, a dance performance, right? This work was, I think, almost two hours long. And within the course uh, of the show, it was almost like something um, disintegrating and, and then being put back together. And in fact, the video or the image that you see behind are these massive terracotta works that I created, which we shot being smashed on a, a 7,000 frame per second camera. And so then slowly, um, reassembled them and pulled them apart and all these different images. 
So it's really, again, that idea of the fluidity of materiality in the face of time and experiencing temporality as a medium. Yeah, stretching and pulling time, certainly something that Merce was very adamant about. And um, having, you know, toured with him and seeing uh, his company perform so many times, there were shows that I went to that were three hours long that felt like 10 hours. And there were shows that I went to that were two hours long that felt like five minutes. And he, he had this uh, really incredible ability to um, change your perception of time within uh, a performance, um, which was quite magical. I suppose the other thing that um, interdisciplinarity gives you is exposure to different audiences. And that must surely be a critical issue when it comes to the brand collaborations that you've done. You've also, you've already mentioned um, Pokemon, for example, but here we have a couple of images of your work with Dior. And um, it strikes me that another aspect of that maybe Duchampian avant-garde tradition that Merce Cunningham and John Cage is part of that you mentioned the chance operations like nobody knows what the collaborators are doing until opening night but there's also a sense in which the found object or found movement is very crucial in that tradition and I kind of want to playfully suggest that for you a brand like Dior is almost like a found object that you're manipulating within your art practice. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I think that in the same way that I was selecting a basketball or a radio, I was doing so because there was an innate uh, knowledge about those things that we all accept. And, you know, the same is true for Dior in a different way. Obviously, I was able to go into their archive, um, really look back at the history of, of uh, Christian Dior himself, the man, um, I was unaware that his early career was actually as a, as a gallerist. He had a gallery in Paris, which was actually a failure and led him then to, um, to fashion. Um, but uh, with, within the collaboration with Kim Jones on that, I really did focus on the kind of object quality of things that I found in his house in the south of France, um, wh where the telephone comes from. Uh, there was a clock that I, uh, had seen in a number of archival photographs of Dior in the early 50s, um, you know, setting a show. Uh, and there's this clock in the background, a lot of images. And I went to the, the, the atelier still exists and the exact same clock is still there. Um, so I thought this kind of resonant idea about time pulled that clock out and created this, um, this work as a kind of motif that, that runs throughout the whole show. Mm. And the uh, compression of multiple time scales and instants in that object is particularly powerful, right? Because you have the archival image of the clock, the direct experience, and this future speculative scenario in which the clock is rediscovered. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think the other thing that is critical for me about um, working with a brand like Dior, as you said, is the expansion of audience. And I think, you know, the art world can be quite insular, art world, design world, architecture world. And I sort of like this quality that in all of those spaces, I am thought of in some ways as an outsider, right? Um, which, uh, or when I collaborate with a brand like Dior, it drastically expands that audience and actually brings them into the fold. I'm sure there's people watching today who haven't watched, you know, another um, design dialogue that you guys have done, who came to this through my Instagram or finding my work through from Dior or Pokemon, um, this way of, sort of bringing this audience together by hijacking actually these other avenues to reach them. Yeah, you know, um, I might even hazard the suggestion that that's the most politically powerful thing that any of us can do right now because we're separated into these tribes and these kind of channels of conversation. So that kind of, um, we actually just had an interview with Iris Van Herpen on Friday and she was saying much the same thing, that it was the, movement for her between spaces of fashion, architecture, choreography, science, that provided her the kind of leverage to produce the new and produce those conversations that are so important. Yeah, because they can become quite insular, right? Conversations are happening within them. And, you know, when I worked with Merce, I found the dance world, when I looked back at the origins of Merce's practice at, you know, Black Mountain College, with John Cage and Rauschenberg, that felt like a much more integrated artistic world where design and fashion and, you know, I mean, a lot of that came out of the Bauhaus, but it feels like it's, at least when I was in school, that wasn't the case, right? I didn't see a lot of that overlap. 
And I think that a lot of, you know, artists of my generation um, have, have made a, a, a sort of goal of reintegrating some of these things. I love the idea that the, there's a 21st century Black Mountain College, but it's globally distributed. And it's something yeah. often... Instagram. Instagram is the 21st century Black Mountain. <laughs> yeah. um, well, there's a lot more to talk about here. And I'm, I'm particularly just thinking, for example, about the way that a brand might push back on your efforts to treat it as a found object. Um, and maybe we can get back to some of that in the Q&A. But I do want to um, get on to what's actually our main topic, which are these two in interrelated projects, mm -hmm. one of which has to do with your own house on Long Island, which was designed by Norman Jaffe, completed in 1971. Um, you're now the owner and engaged in this super ambitious, interesting restoration of it. I wonder if you could just start out by telling people who Norman Jaffe was, in case they don't know. Yeah, so Norman Jaffe um, was an architect, very active from, I would say, mid-60s um, until his death in the 90s. And he sort of came up around, you know, the New York Five, um, which was a very sort of New York-centric type of architecture, um, functioned primarily on the East Coast. Um, and, you know, he died relatively young. He, he was extremely prolific, uh, created hundreds of, of uh, different uh, houses. And, um, you know, he, he, one of his most famous projects is a synagogue out in East Hampton. He built um, a number of uh, towers. Uh, one of them is in Manhattan. Um, and I found you know, his work to be particularly resonant in terms of his, uh, the integration of his buildings into the landscape and his use of natural materials. Most of his uh, early houses were all stone and wood, um, which was you know, in some ways counter to the more rigid kind of uh, modern architecture of um, people like uh, Corbusier or Mies van der Rohe. Um, so a couple years ago, um, when I started to think about uh, um, moving to a house further out of the city, I had a kind of Google alert of a couple different architects and he was one of them. So this house came up. It was actually a very early project for him. Um, the earliest drawings that I have from the house were from 1969. And uh, not, a, not a massive um, project for him, but I think one of the first projects where the client gave him sort of carte blanche to really think about um, how he would situate the property or, or the, the, uh, the house on the landscape. And having lived there now for you know, a year and a half, I'm really seeing throughout the seasons how he framed the views of certain aspects. The house uh, has a view towards the, the Long Island Sound. Um, it sits, as you can see in this image, on a hill, you know, the property sits on kind of two levels. And if you went to the property and you were an architect and you were working quite quickly, you'd probably either put the house at the top of the hill or at the bottom of the hill. It just makes sense. He kind of cantilevered it off of the slope of this hill. So when you enter, you're actually on the second floor, which by the time you get to the back affords this massive view um, out to the, to the sound. Um, so with Snarkitecture, Architecture, we did a very uh, intensive restoration of about 90% of the house, um, interior and exterior. The house is made of all um, cedar. Um, and then uh, altered a couple areas of it. So everything that you see in this image um, is all original, um, except for the, the couch, which I, he, he had this very funny, um, almost all of his projects have these kind of sunken living rooms in them. But I've been to a couple of them that are original and the couches are like very narrow they're like not for lounging they're almost for like you know sitting upright and like drinking like a cocktail or something so it's, the way that he thought about design was very particular to the era um so i so i altered some of that um just a couple other pieces of design um as well as uh in here mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's a roly poly chair there for example exactly yes yeah. And a chair of yours in the foreground that we'll see again in a second. The, I guess the cedar is a big part of the storyline here, right? Because we can see the, the cedar trees are right out the windows and then they're also cladding the structure. So you have this incredible sense of dialogue. It's, it's it, A lot of it, of what you're saying in, in the description of it reminds me a little of Frank Lloyd Wright too, including the cantilevered thing that people might immediately think of falling water, but also that inside outside dialogue. 
I mean, he was definitely, he wasn't directly a student of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but I, he was certainly an admirer. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, you know, aspect that I really appreciated about Jaffe is uh, he, uh, post-World War II, um, he was stationed in Japan. He was a kind of Army Corps of Engineer designing probably like military barracks in, in Japan. And so a lot of his early houses have this kind of Japanese influence on them. You can see it um, in the simplicity of materials, in the way that he used, um, you know, there's images, archival images that I have of him placing rocks <laughs> on the exterior of the house just to frame the view. Um, and so the back portion of the house, um, the house was originally designed for, for a family um, and it was a bit uh, period uh, in certain respects, like the bedrooms were quite small. So we took out one bedroom and actually expanded the kind of master uh, area to have an office, um, expanded the bathroom. So the whole back of it was sort of using his aesthetic but blending it um, with this kind of Japanese uh, environment. My wife is Japanese, so she grew up in this kind of um, this experience. So the floor has tatami. There's a, a very traditional shoji screen in there, which we actually had um, the materials shipped from Japan and uh, found a, a master craftsman uh, in New York who created that for us. The rest of it is all snark architecture, hmm. um, sort of interpreting these kind of blended universes in there. Just a uh, design geek alert. Is that a Charlotte Perrion bamboo chaise with the bit Japanese connection in the foreground? It is. And the name of that chair is the Tokyo Chase Lounge. Yeah. yeah. So she also spent a lot of time in Japan, as we know, um, and was heavily influenced by the use of bamboo uh, in, in Japan. And that chair, the, the, if you've ever sat on one of them, it's all the, the natural flex in the bamboo that creates the cushion of it. Um, such an incredible design and it also the bottom portion of the chair has this like tripod actually it's a it's like a four four pod um, and the, the top portion of the chair is actually um, rearrangeable so you can slide it back and move it um, but it's perfectly balanced wherever you place it mm. yeah um, I, I just love the attention that you're bringing to the objects in the space and of course that has to do with your own objects but the objects that you're bringing in as well mm. and there, there does seem to me to be a really strong relationship between the kind of omnivorousness of your art practice where an R2-D2 or a camera or a radio can come in and be kind of claimed as an object of yours. And then the space that you're living in where you might have an Atari Satsas Tahiti lamp on a desk that you've designed and then you have Norman Jaffe's house. So there's this kind of synthetic vision that I find quite hard to describe, but also extremely recognizable and consistent with the rest of what you're doing. Mm. I mean, just a lot of things that I like, you know, <laughs> try to bring into the, try to bring into the house. Um, so there's, you know, there's a Soriyama book back there. Um, the, the, the big uh, oversized camera that's sitting on the back of that desk there is by this uh, artist from Ghana named Pajo, who's famous for creating these massive like coffins. Um, which are traditional there. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about the, the office. Um, ironically, when I designed that office, I imagined that I would almost never work there because of the studio. But during quarantine, I made like six paintings tacked to the wall in that room there. Mm -hmm. so it really did become this, um, this useful space. And the bathroom, um, you know, over the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time in hotels, obviously mm -hmm. traveling for different things. And I've really refined down <laughs> the perfect space um, for a bathroom. So the right side of that is um, I designed specifically for my wife. Um, there's all of these recessed areas for you know tucking things away, and um, it's like a the house is as much like a boat as you could, you could imagine, where every every area of it has a particular function. So it's really tuned and efficient spatially in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a huge house, right? It's like 2,200 square feet, something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, not huge. Yeah. I, I do want to mention, in case visitors, uh, sorry, viewers, are interested that Pajo actually has a show on at the High Museum in Atlanta right now, um, or at least very recently did. So if you want to check out his coffin-scaled work, they're incredible to look at. Mm. Um, can I just ask you one last question about this theme? And here we see another really strong Japanese reference, this raked, um, raked stone garden. Um, I wanted to ask you about the word sensibility 
because that's a word that gets thrown around a lot. I'm not sure about in relation to your work, but I feel like in the design space, people's sensibility gets described and it's almost like a way of a critic throwing up their hands and saying, well, I don't know what's going on here. So I'm just going to describe it as a kind of loose aesthetic. Mm. And it, I feel like in your case, there's such a strong sense of an aesthetic universe that you're enfolding these various projects into. And I wonder what your thoughts are about maybe where that comes from, how it works. But if you take a step back from everything that you're doing and view it as a totality that's bound together by aesthetics, maybe, where, how do you think that works? Maybe it's too vague of a question, but I hope you see what I'm getting at. Yeah, there's this, um, going back to Japan for a second in relation to this, um, because I've spent so much time there and learned so much from their care about objects and things. There's a term there, which is often used um, in, in, a, in relation to hospitality, which is called omotenashi. And the literal translation of that is like hospitality. Like when you go to a hotel, they, the way that they treat you. Um, but it's actually, it extends to every aspect of life. So it's the way that you, that you bow. It's the way when they hand you something with two hands, it's for a couple of reasons. One is to create more value for the thing that they're handing you. But the other reason is that so it wouldn't drop and create uh, an awkward um, situation. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea of emotion, uh, motenashi, I, I think, is translated to a lot of the things that I collect and look at the way that I want um, um, my spaces to function, which is that there is a care and a, um, a consideration of, all, of every aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. So and it, in some ways, they're always a working project, you know, like this house is not for me, it's not done. The next, the next part of it is the landscape. Um, in fact, this garden was not original to the house. Uh, I added it. Uh, he, uh, in the original in, uh, images of the house, there was a kind of um, meadow uh, growing around the house, which softened the joint of the house to the ground, um, which had kind of, by the time I got it, become overgrown and not, uh, not well kept. So I thought this um, sort of, if you look at the, um, at this garden in plan, it actually has a lot of these curves, similar to the, the doorway openings that we added in this architecture area, mm -hmm. um, because the house is so orthogonal. Like there's every, it's all these boxes that are like intertwined and interlock. Um, and these kind of curved forms, I think, uh, soften it a little bit. Mm. So there, that's so interesting because it, it um, just suggests that that idea of a hospitality aesthetic is something that can be experienced at every scale, right? From the landscape to that moment of handing the object over. Yeah. So that's a fascinating way of thinking about practice. This is true for the creation of an exhibition as well. I mean, when I, when I do a show, I really want it to be an experience. Um, you will never walk into an exhibition that I, that I create where you can see everything at one time, right? even if the space is small, I'm going to divide it in some way so that there is a journey, right? And you're able to kind of um, pause on certain things for longer. Mm. Well, um, that's a good segue to our last topic, which is the Objects for Living project that you did last um, year at Design Miami. And this was in collaboration with Friedman Benda, yeah. uh, which uh, in a lot of ways grew out of your occupation of the Jaffe house as I understand it and could even be considered to be like a meta text if we kind of accept that term in relation to the architectural experience you were having there. Yeah so uh, Mark Benda who um, at Friedman Benda is you know I've known him for a while and um, certainly we've had discussions around my work and and more specifically around um, some of the projects with architecture. and I had the desk that you saw in my office some of the chairs that were in the living room there was a lamp that I, that I created. Um, I made all of these pieces for the house, basically. Um, I wanted things that integrated well into it that didn't feel, um, I think the, the only real uh, chair that I have in there that's either not Jaffe um, or mine is that uh, Faye Too Good um, glass chair. Um, but Mark saw these and said, you know, what are you doing with all of this furniture? Um, so he, he effectively, uh, proposed this idea to create an installation with them, uh, at Design Miami that would effectively recreate a kind of scaled down version, uh, of the house. Um, 
and I wanted to create a rug and different things with it. So actually this, the rug that you're seeing here um, was created by this um, incredible um, company in New York uh, called Noreen Seabrick that creates these rugs actually in Nepal. They're all handmade with like the most premium, you know, materials. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little bit of a process because he, he, I sent him the drawing for the rug and he, he understood it, right? It was a drawing of the floor plan and then he sent it to the, um, you know, the people that he works with in Nepal and they sort of were like, where, this is the plan, but where's the actual rug? And he's like, no, the plan is the rug. Yeah. <laughs> I love that uh, reveal too, of thinking that you're looking at a drawing and realizing that you're like, even in this shift, you know, realizing the scale, the scale right. shift. It's a scaled down version of, you know, the, the living room and the office uh, if they had been combined. So it includes, the idea was that you'd have the floor plan of the, of the space and then in the exhibition, you'd actually have the pieces sitting on top of them. Slightly yeah. out of scale, but um, yeah, created an interesting environment. And then for the presentation in Miami, I actually created a, a full scale room that for me sort of approximated this idea of like a blueprint or, um, mm. you know, we were just seeing like the, uh, the graphic of the architecture, not really the space of it. So it had these translucent walls. Um, and then when you enter the space, you're basically seeing these pieces pulled out. So the desk, um, these two, um, the couch on the left, and then the, uh, the Shanghai chair uh, there on the right, which that chair actually, you know, I, we work um, often in creating base forms for certain uh, uh, of the wall works in foam. And so I, early I had all these massive foam blocks sitting around. And at one point I had cut into them um, just to create these basic uh, seats um, within the studio. And so to kind of carry those one uh, further degree, the chair on the right has actually been recast uh, in a translucent resin, but it, it's, the original form was that hand carved uh, foam. Yeah, yeah. The, um, I think we also get a really good sense, you know, if you approach this from a distance, the kind of peekaboo elements of it, of that sort of slow reveal that you were talking about earlier, like that yeah. lamp peering right. out of the right. clops. And then as you navigate the space, you, you get a better understanding of, of, um, of that Gesamtkunstwerk, that total art environment that you've created. Um, of course, there are, all, again, these kind of found objects like you have at your house that are sitting around the place. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, more Poggio things, this like massive Nokia phone on the right side, mm -hmm. the car on the left, and then a couple of other objects that, you know, I pulled off of my desk mm -hmm. uh, studio and, and shipped down. Yeah. It, the, um, the space also has a kind of virtual quality to it, which I think is partly to do with that carpet already citing the objects that are on top of the carpet. So you're already getting a sense of this cascade of reference. Mm -hmm. But there are things like this blue plant that feels like a ghost object that's some somehow inhabiting the space and is maybe in a different ontological status as everything else yeah this was sort of from the series that i created which were these um pigment dusted objects and it sort of came about through a uh, kind of accident in the studio um where i had a, a cast of a white object that had been sitting sideways and while painting something else it sort of got dusted um mm -hmm. With a, with a particular color, but the, the material only hit it from one side. And when, when it was then turned, it had almost this like shadow of color uh, on it. Um, and so I then employed that um, for a number of different works. This piece is actually a bronze, uh, cast bronze plant um, that's been painted white and then turned sideways and then dusted um, with this uh, brilliant blue pigment. Mm. Those um, happy accidents of the studio are so amazing, right? It's like the famous story about Kandinsky supposedly seeing one of his own paintings upside down and realizing he could do abstraction. So you right. Can see the image in it. Yeah. 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 Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the actual furniture itself too. Um, you know, you've, you've made obviously the seating furniture in the space, the shelving units that are in the back. Um, mm -hmm and then the Shanghai chair that you already mentioned and that amazing lamp. And I have a few um, shots of the pieces themselves that we can just flick through here. 
when you set to the task of designing furniture, what was in your mind and how much of it had to do with design history, how much of it had to do with sculpture? What was your approach to the whole discipline? I mean, because these were all sort of practical, they weren't, they weren't actually designed with like a design audience in mind, really. They were designed like for my house. Huh. So this, uh, if you go back to that first chair just for a second, um, this chair was literally like, when I thought about the approximation of the house, I want, it had like these, these sort of angular forms, you know, this very orthogonal uh, sort of sense. And then I added these kind of curved forms. So I literally just took a couple of the like plans and sort of overlapped them. I also have a lot of Jaffe's original drawings, um, which I managed to get through a couple different um, sources, but he has this kind of play a lot um, within his architecture where he'll set up a condition and then sort of break it um, with a single curve, right? Um, so this chair, um, you know, sits in the living room. Um, these other chairs, you know, they're basically refabricated um, genre Chandigarh chairs. And I, I think I first, the first one that I made of these was a little, maybe like 10 years ago. And it literally was because I couldn't afford one of the, the uh, actual Chandigarh chairs. <laughs> I just found, you know, a carpenter and remade a couple of them for the studio. Um, and then over time, I actually reupholstered them with a canvas, um, the, literally the same canvas that I used for the paintings um, that, that has been dyed. So um, it's kind of a combination of, again, all of these different elements of things that I, um, that I enjoy. Uh, and then the, um, for, for some of the uh, sculptural work in the studio, we will create a plastered dummy cast of them and before they're act, we actually cast the final version in crystal, I'll make drawings on the original so that I can see where I want these erosions generally to be placed. Um, and I tested it out, just sort of placing it on one of these objects as this kind of, you know, it looks like notes for, for something that, that should happen afterwards, yeah. um, which are all hand drawn onto the, onto the canvas uh, of the work. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, compelling as a motif because it implies that maybe it's an instruction that could be interpreted in some Dadaist way, you know, so it's mm -hmm. like it opens up the, the furniture form to some other set of possibilities. Yeah. I also think a lot about Noguchi when looking at this furniture. I don't know whether he was in your mind, but he's such a kind of template of an interdisciplinary practitioner. Yeah, I mean, somewhere in the back of my mind, it's like Noguchi and... Uh, Memphis universe and like a 1980s mall <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> up into my, uh, into my mind that, um, has, you know, birthed these, uh, these forms. So here's the, uh, the Jaffe desk and the Shanghai chairs that you were mentioning earlier, these cast resin pieces, um, right. which maybe more obviously relate to that deconstructivist aesthetic that you pursue in so much of the sculpture. Yeah. The, the interesting things about, um, both of these actually is that I, highly encourage people when these were shown to actually sit in them because they are extremely comfortable in that I literally sat in them, carved them, sat back in them, carved them. So the, the ergonomics of them is actually perfect for cradle, the position of the arm sitting on the top there. Um, this is like a chair, like in the studio, you know, if you're working on something for a long time and you sort of want to sit back for a couple minutes and actually just look at it, um, you know, has these high arms on it, but extremely um, comfortable, rigid, but yeah. I love that. It's like a slow motion Gaetano Pesce. <laughs> um, really interesting uh, lamp uh, with this NASA brand across the top of it. Yeah, so these, you know, um, been spending a lot of time out of my house and finding a lot of sea glass uh, on the beach. And um, some of it has partial fragments of text and things like that. Um, about five years ago, I worked on a, a pretty intensive project with NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is out in Pasadena. Um, so this, the name of this lamp is actually Pasadena Lamp. Um, and I had some uh, materials that they had given me at that time, which were components of um, not, not real uh, objects, but components of spacecraft that had these imprints or in insignias on them. And so I sort of combined those two and imagined this like massive industrial grade um, NASA artifact that had been sort of washing around in the ocean. Um, so 
when you see this actually in detail, it looks like a giant piece of um, sea glass that's been sort of eroded and decayed on the surface. Um, parts of it are chipped. Um, it has the, the original uh, Pasadena um, address on it, which is almost completely uh, obfuscated by the, the decay. Mm. I, we literally made this, I, I 3D scanned a rock that I had found on the beach, um, milled that out of foam, created a mold, and then cast it in resin. And then the final version of it, I literally just dumped bags of rocks on it until it just disintegrated and started chipping. Um, and that was like the final, <laughs> the final piece. Amazing. So we, we see there again, the idea of a fictional narrative that overlays on top of the real narrative of the production of the object. Yeah. And I just want to finish with this um, image. Um, and it, I mean, the shelf is amazing in its own right, but I, I wanted to just ask you this last question, which is about the approved and signature move that we also see on some of the other furniture. And this idea of um, flirting with the idea of being a brand, but also a sort of studio manager or foreman of some kind of production process and kind of what's going on in that idea of the signature of the sign off. You know where that, what's funny is where that came from is that typically in the studio, this is happening less so now, but when I was traveling a lot over the last number of years, oftentimes there will be a, um, a work that's getting prepared in the studio for casting. And when we cast the works, a number of people are involved in it, right? The mixing of material, it all has to happen at one time, but we can't physically see inside of the work because it's closed. Um, and so I would create these drawings and then I would sign them approved so that if they cast when I was away, then I would, they would know, okay, like he's signed off on it. It's fine for us to go ahead with it. Um, and I can't remember there's Mark or somebody saw in the studio and they were like, oh, like it says approved on some of the furniture too. You should like leave it on there. And I thought, oh, it's kind of an interesting idea to have this thing. Like I've actually like reviewed this and looked at it um, and they're all dated too. So all the furniture uh, you know, that, that has been created, they, it all has different dates on it. It's a date of, of completion of it effectively. Yeah. It's to me, it's like a little index of the real situation too. It's like this moment of like fixing it in time mm. Just the fact that you have this crazy whirlwind of temporality around it, all these different yeah. things virtually are interrelating. There's that kind of like a fish hook into the production story, which I, I really love that. Yeah. Um, Let's take some questions, if that's okay, Daniel. We have a few minutes, uh, and we have a lot of questions. We actually got quite a few in advance, and um, I'm just going to uh, start with a question from Joey Chang, which is a question I think you must often be asked, which is, do you have uh, advice to students of today based on your own experiences? So when I finished school, um, I graduated in 2003. And like any young artist, I had no idea how to kind of enter the art world or find a gallery or find, you know, how do you, that's something that they don't teach you in school, which in, in a way is a bit hard to teach. But um, the encouragement that I had from certain professors was, you know, you just need to find avenues to show your work. So I ended up moving back um, to Miami where I grew up. And with a couple of friends, we rented a house, completely gutted it. It was a kind of falling apart um, house just north of downtown. And we created an exhibition space there. It was called The House. It was operational for a number of years. And, you know, it started to get the attention of uh, some of the curators uh, at the museums there, a couple of other collectors. Um, and this, in fact, is how I met uh, Emmanuel Perrotin, who was in Miami. Um, it was right around the time that Art Basel was beginning heard about this exhibition space, came to see it, and you know, um, the rest is history, as they say. But I think part of it for young artists is really about creating your own scenario. You know, you're not gonna get discovered by some, um, some gallerist or, or a curator um, by making work that nobody sees. So you need to create uh, avenues for that. And certainly with social media today, in some ways it's a little bit easier. There's a lot more noise, certainly, um, but the vehicle is there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just to, in case people don't know, Paratan, of course, is your main gallery for your art practice. So that's been a very happy relationship and an important one. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, question from Jesse Salinas. What do you think is essential for someone to be successful in multiple disciplines like yourself and Virgil Abloh? What does it take? Um, I mean, I think it takes the willingness to sort of jump into something. Um, you know, when I, when Merce invited me to work on that first project with him, I had, yeah, I had graduated about a year before he was 60 years, my senior and this kind of legendary figure who had worked with, you know, Warhol and Rothenberg and Jasper Johns. I mean, the most famous artists of the 20th century. And here he's inviting this 24 year old to create a work for stage. I had never been on a stage before. I had, <laughs> I had you know, obviously I'd never worked in it. I had never seen his company perform live. Um, so it was really about studying that medium and trying to understand it. Um, I made Merce actually, you know, he died, uh, 11 years ago. It was on the 26th and I did a post about sort of the earliest, um, uh, pieces that I made with him and the task that he gave me for the first work was to not only create the, um, stage design, but the costumes and the lighting design as well. And I didn't really know how I should go about creating this kind of arc of the lighting. So in the post that I made the other day, there's this drawing at the end, which is literally like a time scale of the lighting. And it shows different elements of the stage at different moments. The piece was 45 uh, minutes long. So there's 45 different squares. Um, and I came to the lighting designer of the company with this drawing. And I was like, this is minute one, minute two. And he was like, what the hell is this? Like, how can I interpret that? But he certainly had never seen anything like that before. Um, so, you know, I think um, I bring these other mediums in because I, I, find, um, I find them as a new vehicle and that there's a potential in them to, use, to be useful. Yeah, it sounds like from what you're saying that there's this uh, maybe quite difficult balance to strike, although maybe it comes intuitively to you, uh, that you have to, both be incredibly flexible and open-minded to the situation you're walking into and also bring a huge amount of yourself with you. And somehow those two things need to both happen at the same time. Yeah, and you certainly need to take the risk too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're just about out of time. So I'm just gonna ask one last question which comes from Adam Kaufman. And sorry, we had so many questions we didn't get to, but um, it's great to see all the interest in the work and the conversation for sure. Uh, so Adam's question is, where do you see the future of your work going? Will it be a, future, a further exploration of the distortion of time or do you think it will go in an entirely different direction? I think the element, the idea of time um, has been present in my work from the very beginning. I mean, even the work that I did in stage design with Merce, but going back to some of my earliest drawings, which were these kind of um, natural scenarios, caverns and icebergs and things like that, that included elements of architecture uh, within them, they played with perception of time because they never included people in them. So they could kind of float in time. They could be the past or, uh, or the future. Um, and I've been quite preoccupied with this idea about archaeology. Um, I have a, a pretty major announcement coming up, uh, I think either later this week or next week, with an uh, uh, encyclopedic archaeological museum, which has uh, given me further access to their archive. Uh, to explore. And, you know, it's really, uh, I would say it's less about a fascination um, with uh, these objects in particular, but more about our perception of time in general and how uh, it can be used and, and played with through different medium. Mm. That's going to be an amazing thing to take on an archaeological collection of that scale. Of course, it goes right to the heart of so much of what you're concerned with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I guess one good thing about uh, being a, an artistic specialist in time is that it never gets old, right? <laughs> so you won't run, run out of uh, material. Yeah. Um, I do want to let uh, viewers know that Stephen Burks, my co-host, will be uh, back on the program on Friday with Patricia Urquiola. So please come back same time, 11 o'clock Eastern time on Friday to hear from um, her, the great uh, industri Italian industrial designer. And... Um, that's all for today. Daniel, thank you so much for this amazing conversation, for letting us into your home virtually on many levels. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll see you next time in Design Dialogue.